All right, let's continue our conversation on Stoicism and go over the Moral Letters by Seneca. Letter 64, I thought, had a couple of very interesting aspects to it. I will read you some passages, not, not the whole letter. From Seneca to Lucilius, greetings. Yesterday you were with us. Now, that would be reason for a complaint if yesterday were the only time. That's why I said, with us. For you're always with me. Some friends had come over so that my household would create some more smoke, not like what billows out of fashionable kitchens alarming the fire department, but just a modest plume, indicating that guests were in the house. A conversation ranged widely, as it does at a dinner party, not pursuing any topic to its conclusion, but skipping around from one thing to another. Then there was a reading. It was a book by Quintus Sextius the Elder, a great man, you may be sure, and a stoic, even if he denies it. By God, what vigour there is in the man, what spirit. And the reason I wanted to read you this is not because Seneca is saying anything groundbreaking here, but I just love that opening, because he is such a wonderful storyteller, and it's so easy to picture the Roman guy getting a little older, sitting in his home, having friends over, they have chimney is smoking, they're having a dinner party, they're talking about all sorts of things. Then there is a reading you know, that at that point in history they were just you know there was no TV, there was no TV shows to discuss, maybe some some you know gladiatorial games to discuss or whatever, but they just start to read aloud a book, right? What I love about this is the image it creates. We're we're talking something close to two thousand years ago, right? I mean, and this is what people did. But think about what people do these days. Is a dinner party not quite a lot like that? You get together with friends, you sit, you eat, you talk about all sorts of things. Not necessarily to conclusion, but just about all sorts of things. And then the topic switches and someone says something else and you talk about something else. I thought it was a wonderful image. And this is one of the things I find interesting. When you read the Stoics, they all have very much their own style. Epictetus is the teacher, and it's very clear that what has been recorded of him are lectures, are, are, are classes. Marcus Aurelius is the emperor, the emperor who is fairly dark and, and, and brooding and, and a very emotional person, but someone who feels, I think, horrible a lot of the time. It's very clear from his writing. He, he, he almost sounds depressed sometimes. He, his philosophy is his only comfort in life. And then you have Seneca, who enjoys life. Who, I think it's no coincidence, he, he quotes Epicurus quite a bit. But he enjoys it. He, go, he, does, he certainly does stoic things. He takes cold baths and he, there, are, there are moments where he only eats bread and water and then he sleeps on a, basically on a, on a cot just to, to experience what it's like to not have a lot of money. He certainly had a lot of money. But now he does these kinds of things, dinner party with friends, and he's really enjoying life. And I think, it's, I think it gives a wonderful insight in that, in that person. Sorry, this was not a groundbreaking stoic thought or uh, explanation of anything. I just thought it was it was such a wonderful image. The guy having it for some reason it reminds me to the um, um, to the to the, the 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 party the opening of the Hobbit. You know, where all the all the all the uh, it's not really a, it's not really a, an expected party, but like you have you have all these dwarves coming in. And they all sit in Bilbo's home and they're just having food and they're eating. It reminds me of that, right? That That's the image, including smoking chimney. Anyway, moving on to something a bit more stoic. Uh, I skip ahead a little bit. I will tell you what is my own state of mind when I read him. We're still talking about Quintus Sextius the Elder, the stoic philosopher. I yearn to challenge every stroke of fortune, to shout, why let up fortune? Do your worst. See, I am ready. I gird myself with the mind of him who seeks a proving ground for himself, a place to demonstrate his courage. Amid the tamer herds he prays to meet the foaming boar, or else the tawny lion, come from the mountaintop. This is a very stoic thought. And what I really like about this is the image of because this uh, this is really quintessential stoicism bad things will happen they will in everyone's life bad things unexpected things unpleasant things anger inducing things frustrating things 
will happen in everyone's life. It's unavoidable. But then, knowing that, there are two things you can do. Option A, something bad happens and it destroys you. Or option B, you bear with it. Now, let's be very frank here. There is a difference between, oh, a a $5 or choose your favorite currency bill fell out my wallet, I lost it. And I heard I have a terminal disease. Right? I'm not trying to make light of anything. Some things in life are indeed terrible and are indeed very far uh, uh, reaching and are, are very bad. But I, I'm talking more about the, the, the everyday things in life that you expect that are not necessarily life threatening, but they're just bad things that happen. You may lose a job, you may you may lose a friendship, or you may you may just have a really frustrating experience. You may have issues at work. You may have these kinds of things that everybody experiences one time or another. And um, you either say, okay, well, this has happened and it's terrible and and frustrating. I will not recover, exaggerating a little bit. Or you say, okay, well, these things have happened. This really sucks. Now, how do I get through this? And the stoic mindset is obviously the latter one. Okay, these things have happened. They were unavoidable. Are they within my control? They're not within my control? Well then what can I do, right? I've given this example a number of times, and it's therefore maybe a little trite, but at, at this point, if you're called into your boss's office, you're fired, then theoretically, the moment you walk out of that office on your phone, you could already be looking at other jobs, right? That is one attitude. That would be a very, very stoic attitude. But, I mean, there is something in between. You can take time to mourn the loss of that job, to be sad, but then you move on, you start to look for other jobs, you you may call some friends, see if they have anything. So, I mean, there are those kinds of opportunities, right? And that's very stoic. But to be crushed by something like that to a point where you almost can't recover makes your life a lot less pleasant, right? Makes it a lot harder, makes it a lot more... um, difficult uh, than it necessarily needs to be so that i think is certainly something to to consider and i i like the way seneca puts it very almost belligerently here as a challenge to fate it's like well bring it on bring it on see what happens this is my stoic challenge excellent book by the title by the way stoic challenge a uh, very worthwhile read from a professor whose name eludes me now, Bill Irvine, I think. Anyway, you can you can you can find it when you when you Google Stoic Challenge, and he describes this in great detail. He's trying to be a Stoic, and he says, "I do this all the time. I look at all the bad things that happen to me as challenges. This is something fate has put in my path. Okay, that's an opportunity for me to practice Stoicism, because as I've said many times before." It's great to say, I'm a Stoic, when everything is going well in your life. It's much harder to say, I'm a Stoic, when, when your life is falling apart around you, to, to exaggerate a little bit. So I find that very interesting and a very interesting approach, right? Bring it on. See how I can handle it. It may be hard, but I welcome it. If you can do that, imagine how much easier, relatively speaking, your life becomes, because you welcome challenge. Okay, this is hard. This is a difficult situation. Now let me show that I can figure this out, that I can handle this right? And the last section I wanted to read you was this one. I yearn to have something to conquer, something I can endure as part of my training, for this is another of Sextius's outstanding qualities. He will show you the magnitude of true happiness and yet not take away your hope of achieving it. You will realize that it is far above you and yet you know that one who wants, sorry, and yet know that one who wants to can attain that height. But you have to want it. You have to be willing to do that and do that work. And that at times in life is very, very difficult. I certainly don't make light of that. But once you have that approach, even the hard things in life, I think, can become easier. Not necessarily easy, but easier. Easier to manage, easier to do, easier to cope with, easier to survive. Very interesting. I wonder if um, I'll look into that. Quintus Sextius the Elder, if, if any of his writings have been saved, and if they're available somewhere. Anyway, 
this is what I had for this letter. Uh, I hope this was useful. Let me know what you think about this sort of the stoic challenge. Is that something that you think is applicable in your life? You kind of, whenever something bad happens, you think, okay, bring it on. Let's see. This is a challenge. Let's let's put these principles into practice. Or is it hard? It is hard. But I mean, is it something you think might get easier with practice? Let me know. Hope this was useful. I'm glad to see you again next week.